Would you take God's Word now and turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, and today I want to bring a message to you entitled, Five Compelling Reasons for the Importance of the Resurrection. Five Compelling Reasons for the Importance of the Resurrection. And I want to begin by reading the first four verses of the book of Romans. I trust you have God's Word with you and that it's open and that it is ready. Pen in hand, paper on your knee. You're going to want to jot down these five compelling reasons. This is how the book of Romans begins. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Now listen to this. Who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. According to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. As the Apostle Paul took pen in hand and wrote the book of Romans, he could not write for very long without mentioning the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In fact, this is not a surprise because the book of Romans is a book about the gospel. The main idea of the book is found at the end of verse 1, the gospel of God. This is a book about the gospel of God. And at the heart of the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The early apostles and first disciples could not preach the cross without also preaching the empty tomb. The two go hand in hand together. Without the resurrection, the crucifixion of Christ is empty. There had been thousands of convicted criminals crucified upon Roman crosses in Judea in the first century. But only one who was ever crucified upon a Roman cross was ever raised from the dead. And it was the resurrection of Christ that singled out Christ in His uniqueness, in His divine person, and in His finished work for sinners. So we are not the least bit surprised as we begin to read the book of Romans that in the opening books of this towering epistle, that we should find Paul addressing the subject of the resurrection. No resurrection, no gospel. Paul could not articulate the gospel without expounding the resurrection in its fullness. And so what I want to do this morning in our time together in this Easter message is to trace for you through the book of Romans the central importance of the resurrection to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The importance of the book of Romans certainly is found in its contribution to define and to describe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. The book of Romans finds its unique contribution in the canon of Scripture in the full, rich, theological definition of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And many a theologian and Bible teacher and expositor have pointed to the book of Romans as the most important book in the Bible, certainly the one that gives the most profound treatment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the book of Romans in your Bible is placed first in the order of Paul's 13 epistles. You need to understand he didn't write it first. But when the canon of Scripture came together, and when the early church compiled the 27 books of the New Testament, of the 13 epistles written by Paul, they put Romans number one on the list because it is most important in its description of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But more than that, it is placed number one in the 21 epistles of 
that are found in the New Testament. It is placed before not only the other 12 epistles by Paul, but it comes before James, it comes before Peter's epistles, it comes before John's epistles, it comes before Jude, it is placed before the book of Hebrews, it is placed at the very outset of the epistles of the New Testament because it stands as the number one central most important book in expounding what is the true gospel, the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is remarkable and what is important to us today is that there is no other book in the Bible that makes more of the resurrection than the book of Romans. We find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the actual resurrection account at the end of those four Gospels. And when we read the book of Acts, we read the apostolic preaching of the resurrection of Christ. But when we come to the book of Romans, the veil is pulled back and we are allowed to see the brilliant luster of the golden, glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are allowed to see in this book more so than in any other book in the Bible the doctrinal richness and the theological brilliance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so what I want to do today is to survey the book of Romans with you and to discover the critical importance of the resurrection of Christ. No Christian... No Christian can afford to be ignorant of any of these five reasons for the importance of the resurrection of Christ. Our entire faith in Christ rests upon these sturdy pillars of the resurrection that uphold the Christian faith in which we have placed our trust. And so I want to note for you now five compelling reasons for the importance of the resurrection. Here is reason number one. The resurrection provides, number one, here it is, proof of Christ's deity. Proof of Christ's deity. The resurrection of Christ proved that He was exactly who He claimed to be. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to have a unique relationship to the Father. He claimed to have come from the Father. And He claimed that He would be going back to the Father after His death. And the resurrection became, listen to this, the ultimate validation that Jesus Christ is God, the Son of God, and is fully God. That's what we see in these opening verses of the book of Romans. Look at it again with me, these first four verses. This is how Paul begins this letter. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And I want to say every believer is set apart for the gospel of God. There is one chief ministry that God has for every one of our lives And it is the gospel ministry of propagating the saving message of Jesus Christ to this world. It is called the gospel of God, meaning that it originated with God and from God. This is God's message. This is God's gospel. It's not even the church's gospel. It's not man's gospel. It is the gospel of God. It has come down to us from God. Verse 2, which He promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This is not a new gospel. This is not a new message. Oh, no. This is an old message, an unchanging message. Paul says that this gospel is the only gospel and it ran through the pages of the Old Testament. When we come to the New Testament, there's not a new gospel that has appeared. It is the one and same gospel of God recorded in the Holy Scriptures, verse 2, proclaimed by the prophets throughout Old Testament times. And now verse 3, he says, concerning his Son. You see, the gospel is focused upon God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Concerning his Son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh. 
This good news of the gospel centers in God's Son, Jesus Christ. And that leads us now to verse 4. This is such an important verse. Who, who was declared, that means marked out, to be distinguished by, who was declared the Son of God. And when he says the Son of God, he is referring to the fact that Jesus is one in divinity with the Father. He is one in essence with the Father, like Father, like Son. He is the Son of God, meaning He is co-equal and co-eternal with His Father in heaven. And He has declared the Son of God, how? By the power of the resurrection, or by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection would prove to be the supreme validation of God Almighty in heaven that His Son is exactly whom He claimed to be by raising His Son from the dead. Now, I want you to turn back with me, if you would, to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12. And this will be very worth your while to turn back to the middle of this first Gospel. And in Matthew chapter 12, we come to a pivotal moment in the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. He has declared Himself to be heaven's Savior, the Son of God. He has performed miracles and performed signs that have all authenticated that Jesus is come from God, that He is equal with God, that He is the only Savior of mankind. And we come now in verse 38 to a very pivotal moment in the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And in the face of all of this preaching and all of this instruction and all of the miracles that our Lord had pre performed where it was abundantly clear who He was and what He had come to do, in verse 38, then some of the scribes and the Pharisees said to Him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. A sign? He has performed untold numbers of signs to this point. They have heard the truth as no generation has ever heard the truth. And these Pharisees and scribes, those who know the Word of God more than anyone else in this generation, and they said, Teacher, we need more proof. We need more evidence. We need for you to validate who you are so that we can know who you are. Jesus answered, verse 39, and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but. And He says, you will only be given one more sign, one more miracle that will validate who I am and what I have come to do. And with this, Jesus is placing the entirety of His earthly ministry and His mission of redemption to be validated upon this one pillar. There will be no sign but the sign of Jonah the prophet. That's the only other sign that you will receive. Verse 40, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And with this, Jesus draws from the Old Testament story of Jonah, as you know, who spent three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. And Jesus is saying that is a picture of my coming resur resurrection, that I will be buried in the earth for three days, crucified on Friday, buried at, on Friday afternoon, spend all of Saturday in the grave, and then on Sunday morning, I will be raised from the dead and walk out of that tomb, a living, risen, victorious Savior. 
Jesus said, this is the ultimate validation and authentication that I am the Son of God. And my friend, throughout the rest of his earthly ministry, from this point forward, Jesus emphasized his resurrection to be the underpinnings of the faith of the disciples to validate the claims that he had made. Look at Luke 6, uh, excuse me, Matthew 16 and verse 21. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. Now watch this and be raised up on the third day. Look across the page, chapter 17, verse 9. As they were coming down from the mountain, referring to the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. That would be the climactic verification of all that he said, you declare my message once I am raised from the dead. Look at chapter 20, verses 18 and 19 of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 20, 18 and 19. Jesus, in verse 17, was about to go up to Jerusalem. He took the twelve disciples aside by themselves, and on the way he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles, referring to the Romans, to mock and scourge and crucify him, and on the third day he will be raised. I'm telling you to fulfill this, only God Almighty in human flesh could fulfill this kind of a statement. Look at Matthew 27 in verse 63. Matthew 27 in verse 63. This was well known in this day. Although it had been said to His disciples, this kind of statement and declaration percolated throughout Judea. This message had a, had a ripple effect such that it was known by even Jesus' enemies who had the most to lose by His resurrection that He had claimed that after He was put to death that He would be raised from the dead. And so in Matthew 27, verse 62, we read, now on the next day, after the preparation, meaning preparing his body for the burial, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate. Boy, you talk about birds of a feather flocked together. The unholy trinity right there. Verse 63, and said, Sir, we remember that while when he was still alive, that deceiver said... After three days, I am to rise again. Even the, the unconverted lost Jews knew this. Even the pagan Romans knew this. Jesus had emphasized this again and again and again. He would go to Jerusalem. He would be put to death. But on the third day, He would be raised from the dead. So verse 64, therefore give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. And they had heard the emphasis on the third day. Make it secure. Otherwise, His disciples will come and steal Him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go now, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure along with the guard. They set a seal on the stone and standing behind that seal was the authority of Caesar and the authority of the Roman government. And if that seal was to be broken and the, and the tomb tampered with, 
Those who stood guard that day, their lives would be taken from them. And you know the rest of the story. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. And the stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out. He could have just walked right through the stone. But to let the watching world in to see that the tomb was empty and that his, his clothes were laying there and that God had intervened in the affairs of His Son, and that God had raised His Son from the dead. And it was the finger of God pointing at that empty tomb as if to say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. So look at the next chapter. Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone. Just like it was a tennis ball. Just rolled it away. And sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, meaning it, it, it shone with brilliance. And his clothing as white as snow, as he has descended from the very presence of God in heaven. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. That means they fainted and went unconscious and were like dead men just lying on the ground. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. Watch this. He is not here, for He is risen, just as He said. You see, Jesus had foretold His own resurrection And knowing that His resurrection would be the ultimate authentication and validation of His claim to be God, the Son of God, and to have come from heaven on this mission of redemption. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, I want to say to you again, is the single greatest proof for the deity of Jesus Christ. This is the first reason for the resurrection. It was to put God's stamp of approval upon His Son and to single Him out as being His own darling Son. Now, there's a second reason. Not only as proof of Christ's deity... And I trust that you know that Jesus is exactly whom He claimed to be. I trust that you know that He's no imposter. You see, C.S. Lewis said, Well, all humanity stands with a tri a trilemma in front of them. Either Jesus Christ is a lunatic or Jesus Christ is a liar, or Jesus Christ is Lord. There are no other options on the table. Either He is deceived, or He is deceiver, or He is deity. There are no other options. And I trust that you know that Jesus Christ is exactly whom He claimed to be, the virgin-born, sinless Son of God who came to this world, the God-man, to be the mediator between God and man, the only Savior of mankind. I trust you know that and that you've put your faith and your trust in Him and in Him alone. But second, I want you to see, not only does the resurrection provide, number one, proof of Christ's deity, but second, proof of our justification. I want you to come back to the book of Romans. And I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 4, verses 24 and 25. Romans chapter 4, 
verses 24 and 25, and here's what we will discover. That the resurrection proves that Christ not only is who He claimed to be, but the resurrection proves that He accomplished what He claimed to accomplish in His death upon the cross. Two totally different issues. The first deals with who. He is validated for who He claimed to be. This is a second issue. This is the validation of what? That what He came to accomplish, He was successful before God. This is validated in the resurrection. Look beginning in verse 23. The sentence begins in verse 23. Now, not for His sake only, referring to Abraham's faith. Was it written that it was credited to him, the it refers to justification, the righteousness of God in Christ. It wasn't simply for Abraham's sake that this is recorded, that he would be justified by faith, verse 24, but for our sake. You see, we're saved the same way that Abraham was saved, by faith alone. But for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in Him, now watch this, referring to God the Father, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now, if you're going to believe in God, you're going to have to believe in a God who raised His Son from the dead. You say, you know, I believe in God. I just, I'm not into the miracles in the Bible. I'm not into the supernatural. Well, then you're going to be into hell. Because the Bible says the only true saving faith there is is the faith in God who raised His Son from the dead. If you refuse that, you have concocted a God of your own making, small g, and you have not believed in the one true God in heaven and earth Because the true God has raised His Son from the dead. Now, the next verse amplifies this even more. He who was delivered over because of our transgression stopped there. Who delivered Him over? Well, there is a sense in which Judas delivered Him over. And there is a sense in which the Jewish leadership delivered Him over. And there is a sense in which the Romans delivered him over. But in the ultimate sense, it is the one who would raise him from the dead is who delivered him over. You see, Jesus was delivered over according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You see, this was God's eternal plan and purpose that God would deliver up His Son for us to be our Savior and to bear our sins upon the cross. To reject this is to reject God. You cannot reject the resurrection of Christ and still receive God and have God. Because He is the God who has raised His Son from the dead. He is the God who has delivered His Son over to a cross, there to die, bearing our sins upon that cross. This is the God who took our sins and transferred them to the Lord Jesus Christ. He became our sin-bearer upon that cross. And through the shedding of His blood, this Savior made the only atonement for our sins. It is this God who delivered over His Son. It is this God who raised His Son from the dead. It is this God alone who saves from sin. Look at the end of verse 25. Because the question must be answered. How do we know that the death of Christ was sufficient for our sins? How do we know that the atonement that was made for us is sufficient to justify us and to bring the righteousness of God in Christ to be imputed to our accounts. At the end of verse 25, we have the answer. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because 
of our justification. My friend, the moment Jesus paid the price upon the cross, eternal salvation was secured for all who would believe in Him. And on the third day, God raised Him from the dead for because of our justification, meaning that the righteousness that Christ provided through His death upon the cross was fully accepted by the Father in heaven the moment He bowed His head and dismissed His spirit because seconds before that, He cried out in John 19, verse 30, It is finished. Not I am finished. It is finished. The atonement has been made for sin. The divine wrath of God has now been placated, has been satisfied. Redemption has been purchased by Christ upon the cross. It is finished. Reconciliation between a holy God and unholy sinners has now been accomplished. And the full purchase price for the forgiveness of sins has been made in full. It is finished. Not another drop of blood to shed. Not another atonement needs to be made. It is finished. How may we know that the Father in heaven on the other side, as He looks down upon Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago, as the angels are surrounding there unseen with swords ready to rush to protect, How may we know that the atonement was perfect and righteousness provided for our justification? This verse tells us forever that it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that provides the validation that His sacrifice was sufficient for our sins. What if Jesus had not been raised from the dead? Well, you can read 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's 12 through 19, and read for yourself. Then our faith is foolish. We've believed in vain. We preach in vain. We witness in vain. We worship in vain. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, it would have demonstrated to the watching world that the sacrifice of Christ was an insufficient sacrifice to save sinners. But it is the resurrection of Christ from the dead by the power of God that has validated that His shed blood and the giving of His life for us has been accepted as the perfect payment for our sins. Sometimes I meet people who say something like this, I just don't know that God could ever forgive me for this. I just don't know if if God could ever accept me or if God could ever receive me. If that is in your heart and in your thoughts today, I point you to the empty tomb as the validation of God the Father in heaven that the sacrifice of the Son was more than sufficient to take away all of your sins. It's the proof of our justification. It is the proof that the righteousness of Christ has been credited to your account. And that when God looks upon you, He sees the perfect righteousness of Christ that clothes you and that you are accepted by a holy God in heaven through the merit of the death of the Son of God. It is the resurrection of Christ from the dead that guarantees our acceptance with the Father because of the sacrifice of the Son. Have you put your trust in this Christ? Have you come to believe upon Him and what He has done for sinners upon the cross? I say to you that God validates no other way of salvation. 
God has validated no other religious leader and God has validated no other religious activities that would ever gain you acceptance with God in heaven. God has provided only one validation from heaven, and it is the validation of the death of His Son upon the cross as being the only and exclusive way of salvation to the Father. It matters not how sincere you are or insincere you are. It matters not how religious you are or irreligious you are. There is only one validation from heaven as a way of salvation, and it is in the blood of Christ, and it is the resurrection of Christ that proves that salvation is in the name of the Lord only. Buddha is dead and still in the grave. Mohammed is dead and decayed. Joseph Young was a a fraud and he died and he is in the grave. Jesus Christ is the true way of salvation. And God has raised him from the dead. A dead Savior cannot save anyone. Only a living Savior. Now there's a third compelling reason for the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Not only the proof of Christ's deity, and not only the proof of our justification, but third, the resurrection of Jesus Christ provides... Number three, proof of our sanctification. And I want you to come to Romans chapter 6, if you would. Romans chapter 6. And what we discover is that all whom God justifies, He also sanctifies. And the resurrection of Christ from the dead are the pillars that undergird not only our justification being declared the righteousness of God in Christ, but it also undergirds a holy life and a changed and transformed life. In other words, all whom God justifies, He gives new life to them in regeneration And it is the very supernatural life of the risen Christ that dwells within the hearts of believers. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. Now look at Romans 6. I want to begin reading in verse 1. Verses 4 and 5 is where I'm headed. But beginning in verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Stop right there. He's been teaching on justification. That where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. Meaning, no matter how much sin you have in your life, the grace of God is more than abundant to cover all of that sin and to give you the perfect righteousness of Christ. So Paul anticipates an imaginary objector who would corruptly and carnally think this. Well, if where sin does abound, grace does much more abound, then why don't I just continue living in sin after God justifies me? And the greater my sin will be the greater the grace of God. See, this will glorify God for me to continue to live in my sin. It will show how forgiving God is. And so Paul writes to stop such an end run of thinking and to expose it for what it is as totally faulty thinking. And he says in verse 2, May it never be. God hasn't justified you for you to live however you want to live. God forbid, some translations say. May it never be. Then he says, how shall we, and the we is important, the we refers to believers. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? How can you live in a lifestyle of sin, continuing to pursue your sin, if you have truly died to sin? So that begs the question, have I died to sin? Does sin no longer have mastery over me? Does sin no longer have dominion over my life? 
And so Paul goes on to deal with this in verse 3, and he says, Or do you not know that all of us, and the us refers to all believers, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? This does not refer to water baptism. There's not a drop of water in verse 3. It refers to a spiritual baptism being immersed into Christ, being identified with Christ and being placed into Christ. And what he is teaching is this, is that when Jesus died on the cross, He died for our sins and that we were in Christ even as we had been in Adam and that when Christ died for our sins, we died to sins. In other words, it is through the death of Christ, not only is there a positional righteousness provided in justification, but there is a powerful, practical sanctification that is made real in our lives immediately the moment we are regenerated and born again from above. Why? Because when Christ died, we died to sin. Now, he explains this further in verse 4. Therefore, we, again, all believers, have been... Notice the past tense... If you're a believer in Christ, this has already happened in your life. Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death. Not referring to water baptism. That's only a picture of this baptism. This is a spiritual baptism whereby we are placed into Christ and identified with Christ, taken back 2,000 years ago to the time when Jesus died upon the cross. R.G. Lee took a group of people to the Holy Land a number of years ago and had shared with them that this was his first trip. He had never been here. And the tour guide said, Now, how many of you have been here to Calvary before? And R.G. Lee raised his hand. He said, I have. And he said, I thought you said this is your first trip. And he said, Well, it is. It's just I went to Calvary 2,000 years ago. And when Christ died, I died. And when Christ died to sin or for sin, I died to sin. Do you know there's been a death of you? Do you know salvation doesn't occur until you come to the end of yourself? Until there is a death of self? And we are buried with Christ, it says. Now look at the the middle of verse 4. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, meaning all the inherent power and sovereignty of the Father, put on display in the resurrection of Christ, notice this, so we too might walk in newness of life. What this is saying is the very power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the very power of God that converted your old hardened heart and is the very power of God that has now raised you from the grave of sin to walk in newness of life. This is what Paul meant in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. That's the greatest miracle God ever performs. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. An old life of sin, an old pursuit of sin, an old enslavement to sin. And behold, new things have come. A new holy life that is given by God, and it is the power of the resurrection and the life of the believer who has now been baptized into Christ and identified with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. You know what conversion is? It is a death, burial, and resurrection. You know that? That's what conversion is. That's why when we baptize people, we don't just sprinkle a little water on them because that doesn't really picture much of a conversion, does it? What really pictures conversion, according to the Bible, is a death, burial, and resurrection. 
You see, when you were converted, you died to sin and your old way of life. It, it's over. It's totally over. It's done with. And you were buried and have been raised to walk in newness of life. This is the importance of the resurrection. When Christ died, you died. But when He was raised, you were raised with Him to live a brand new life. So he says in verse 5, For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, and we have, if we're saved, certainly, meaning undoubtedly, unquestionably, surely, certainly, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Every conversion to Christ is a spiritual resurrection, much like His physical resurrection, because it is the same power of God that raises dead sinners to walk in newness of life. Can I show you one other verse in the book of Romans? Come to chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And I told you that the resurrection is just sprinkled all through this book as Paul puts on display now the towering, theological, stunning profound brilliance of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It is undergirding the entirety of our Christian experience. We read in Romans 8, and what I want you to see is in verse 11, but I really need to begin in verse 6. And I, let me just tell you what's going on here. Paul is telling us there are two classes of people in the world. Not three, not four, not five, two. There are those who are in the flesh and there are those who are in the Spirit. That's it. There are the saints and the ain'ts. And he couldn't make this contrast any more polarized and extreme. And so he begins in verse 6, and he says, For the mind set on the flesh is death, meaning spiritual death. And that's the lost person. His mind is set on things of this world and set on things of this earth. And it is just death. But the mind set on the Spirit, referring to the things of God and the focus and the preoccupation and the perspective and the vantage point. Uh, that mind is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It's, it's at enmity with God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. Watch this. For it is not even able to do so. That's total depravity. The lost person doesn't even have the capacity to throw off its own death and subject itself to the law of God. So verse 8, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And he's not talking about a, a carnal Christian here. He is talking about a carnal unbeliever. He's talking about someone who lives in the flesh. Verse 9, however... And he makes this contrast, you are not in the flesh. No believer is in the flesh, meaning that's the sphere of your life. That is the, the, the environment of your life. You don't live in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, and here's the qualification, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him. If you don't have the Spirit of God living in you, You've never been born again by the Spirit of God from above. You may be in church, but you're not in Christ if you don't have the Holy Spirit within you. It says in verse 10, If Christ is in you, meaning if you're saved, though the body is dead, and the body here refers to the body of flesh, or your, your fleshly appetites, your fleshly lusts, your fleshly desires. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now, here is what we want to see. 
But if the Spirit of Him, referring to the Holy Spirit of God, who raised Christ from the dead, dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That is to say... If you have been raised by Christ to walk in newness of life by the power of the resurrection, there is a new life that is pulsating through your soul. You have a new mind. You have a new heart. You have new desires. You have a new will. You have a new understanding. All things have been made new in your life. And he says in verse 11, it is the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive within you. And when Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, as he has this pastoral prayer for the church at Ephesus, he prays, oh, I, I pray that God would open your eyes and that there would be a spirit of illumination and that you would understand what is the power of God that raised Christ from the dead, that this power is in your life through the Holy Spirit who indwells you. Oh, I wish that you understood this resurrection power for your daily life every moment. Do you realize you have the resurrection power of God in your life to do all that God has called you to do and there is no shortage on His power? Do you realize that when you live your Christian life, you're not to live it in your own strength? There is no one more frustrated on this planet than someone who's trying to live the Christian life without Christ. It is the resurrection power of God that raised Christ from the dead, I'm telling you, that is in your soul to raise you to walk in newness of life and to give you the power of God to do simple things like loving unlovely people, to turn the other cheek, to forgive others, to serve without having to be recognized, to reach out and to witness and to find courage and boldness to be a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these things, to have patience, to know joy, it's all in the power of the resurrection in your life. I must hasten... There is more that I want to say. Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. But I'll save that for another Easter. There's a fourth reason I want you to have this. We'll land the plane here quickly. The fourth reason is that the resurrection is proof of our glorification. I want you to come to Romans chapter 8, which is the chapter on glorification. Romans chapter 8, and the resurrection of Christ proves the future glorification of all believers. I hope you've picked up the fullness of this justification, sanctification, glorification, undergirding all of this is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is this power of God under these three aspects of our so great salvation that is energizing our salvation and carrying us all the way to heaven. It is the accomplishment of the cross, but it is the power of the resurrection that is fulfilling this. Now, this section on glorification begins in verse 18 in the book of Romans. And I want to look at verse 18. The subject now shifts to the future. And when I say glorification, I'm referring to the Christian in heaven, fully made in the image of Jesus Christ. For I consider, verse 18, that the sufferings of this present time, 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. And with this verse, Paul launches now to this profound subject of future grace and the glorification of all who are justified and sanctified. And he says, My present trials and tribulations are so minimal compared to the future glory that awaits me in heaven. And then in verse 23 says, and not only this, referring to the future recreation of the physical universe, but we ourselves, having the first, first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and the resurrection of our body. And what he is saying is, I'm longing for this state of glorification because in glorification there will be the redemption of my body. My soul has been redeemed. My spirit has been redeemed. But the trials of this life are just buffeting my body and they're beating me down. And, and to go on serving God comes at a great price on my physical frame. And oh, I long for that day to be glorified in the presence of God. And then the redemption of my body, all that I want to do that's inside my heart, I will finally have a body that will have no limitations and I can go full tilt for God, go all out for God in my glorified state. That's what he is saying in verse 23. And my physical body is just holding me back right now. I can't do what I used to could do when I was younger and serving God. And so in verse 29, he becomes swept up in this thought of glorification. And he says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. Stop right there. That's the full gambit from eternity past to eternity future, being foreknown in eternity past and then to be predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, ultimately that plays out in glorification in my full, final conformity to the image of God's Son. And with this statement, Paul just puts his arms around eternity past and eternity future. And he says, verse 30, "...and these whom He predestined, He also called, and these whom He called, He also justified." And these whom He justified, He also glorified. We've gone through these verses many times. I have nothing new to say on this, simply to say that our entire process of salvation is taking us ultimately to glorification. And what verse 29 and 30 give us is what theologians have referred to, the ordo salutis, meaning Latin for the order of salvation. And we have here foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. This is uh, an elementary ordering of the steps of salvation from eternity past to eternity future. And he concludes this chapter in verses 35 through 39 just amplifying the certainty of our future grace that if you have ever been justified and ever been called by God, it is inevitably certain, it is absolutely certain that you will be glorified in heaven. This is the eternal security of the believer. This is the perseverance of the saints. And that's why he says, verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? The answer to that is nobody, no one will ever separate God's love His saving, redeeming love towards you in Christ. Not just His warm fuzzies towards you, having little tender moments with you with a teddy bear. That's not what He's talking about. He's talking about His redeeming, saving, electing, predestining love towards you. Nothing will ever separate you from this saving love in God. He says, 38 and 39, I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is such an airtight case for the eternal security of the believer. If you think that you could lose your salvation, I say you do not know the grace of God. You may be saved, but in spite of your faulty theology, 
Now, at the very center of all of this is verse 31 to 34. This is the the very heart of this section. So he says in verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? And he he imagines people who would bring charges against God's elect. And he says it doesn't matter what anyone else says about God's elect. They are God's elect. All that matters is what God has to say about God's elect. It doesn't matter what accusations the devil would bring, nor what demons would bring, nor what what unsaved people would bring. If they are God's elect, all that matters is what God has to say. And so he says in verse 32, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Are you going to reverse the the declaration, the forensic declaration of God? I believe not. It's God's court. It was God's declaration. It was God who imputed the perfect righteousness of Christ to you. It is an irrevocable imputation. It can never be rescinded nor reversed. That decision can never be overturned by a higher court because there is no higher court. God is the Supreme Court. There is no court of appeal. So God is the one who justifies. Now look at verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? And the answer is there is no one to bring accusation against God's elect. Now it all resides in Christ. Christ Jesus is He who died. And upon that cross, He died bearing our sins. He suffered in our place. He shed His blood. He provided the atonement and the righteousness for us. Yes, rather, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us. And what does He do in this intercession? But to continue to keep all of the elect saved. That He might guard all of His sheep. That He might keep the church for whom He suffered and bled and died all secure in His arms. He loses not a one of His sheep. Why the mention of the resurrection? If it is by the death of Christ that He actually paid the price for our salvation. Why mention the resurrection in this whole chapter on glorific- or section on glorification? What does the resurrection of Christ have to do with future grace? It is this. It is by the resurrection of Christ that Jesus has been raised and has ascended to the right hand of God the Father where He is now enthroned at the right hand of the Father and is now my advocate pleading His own precious righteousness on my behalf And He is the one at the right hand of the Father who keeps me saved and keeps me secured and sealed in His grace. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, then I'm on my own. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, I could receive His purchase of my salvation, but I'm on my own to keep it. But if on the cross He paid the penalty for my sin, was buried, but raised from the dead and now enthroned at the right hand of the Father and now moment by moment intercedes for me, He keeps me saved forever. And as Charles Haddon Spurgeon said and John MacArthur mentioned two weeks ago, It is this element of glorification that sweetens the pot for everything in the preceding verses. What good is it it if I was foreknown by the Father in eternity past but could somehow 
fall from grace. What good is it to be called by God and to be justified by God and to receive the righteousness of Christ if I could somehow fall out of being in Christ? What good is that? To be saved for only five years or ten years or for a moment in time. But if Christ, through His resurrection now ever lives at the right hand of the Father to preserve the entirety of all of His benefits of salvation for us, His people. How important is the resurrection? Because it raises Christ from the dead to be enthroned at that place of highest authority in the entire universe whereby He now keeps me and preserves me and saves me forever in a state of grace. It is the resurrection of Christ from the dead that enables me to be kept forever by His strong hand. Well, I will finish this next Easter. (laughs) Promise that you will come back for the fifth compelling reason for the resurrection of Christ. For those of us who have believed upon Christ, the resurrection is good news. I could not bring you any better good news than to tell you that Jesus is exactly whom He claimed to be. He was not an imposter. And the resurrection of Christ guarantees that. I have no better news, good news to tell you this day than that the justification, sanctification, and glorification which Christ accomplished upon the cross is undergirded by His resurrection and He ever lives to make intercession for us. There is no better news to tell you today But if you do not know Christ, I cannot think of a worst message for you to hear today. And I really don't want to end with this point, but I feel like I must deal honestly with you. If you do not know Christ, this is the most terrifying message you could ever hear in your life. Because God has raised the judge from the dead. That's why the Pharisees and the Sadducees killed him. They didn't want to deal with him. But God raised him from the dead. And they will stand before him in the final day. Acts 17.31 says that God has fixed a day by which he will judge the world by his son, Jesus Christ, whom he raised from the dead. If you do not know Christ today, and should you die without Christ, you will meet Christ. You will meet the risen Christ face to face, and it will not bode well with you in that day. As every mouth will be closed, and you will be condemned and damned. Condemned and damned to a Christless eternity in hell forever. And God will be glorified in the destruction of your soul that will never come to an end. This day, Christ is being offered to you. And for some of you, there may not be another gospel offer invitation or gospel offer ever made to you. If you would receive it, it would be the greatest thing to ever happen to your life. But if you reject it, your blood is on your own hands. And you will stand before a judge who has been raised from the dead, who has been waiting for you for a long time and has impeccable books and the entire case of your life is recorded. 
every sin, every thought, every deed, everything that you should have done and didn't do, everything that you did and shouldn't have done, sins of omission, sins of commission, every frivolous word, every time you heard the gospel and just got up and walked out, you'll stand before Jesus Christ who's been raised from the dead and He will damn your soul forever. That's a tough message, isn't it? It's a true message. None of us here want you to have to appear before the judgment without a Savior. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. You, sir, would be exhibit A as a fool. You, ma'am, would be exhibit A as a fool to hear this message and then go meet Christ. Having never repented of your sin, and having never believed upon Christ. What a glorious Easter this could be for you if you would but believe upon Christ. If you walk out of here today without Christ, you are adding to your condemnation in that final day. Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. If you would just look to Christ and be saved, would save you forever. And the Lord only knows how desperately you need to be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you for your grace, for your mercy through the atonement of Christ and the power of the resurrection. And we ask and pray, God, that sinners will look to You today and be saved, knowing there is no other hope but in Christ. 